Okay, so welcome to this uh, second lecture of this radiation damaging materials. And in this lecture, we're looking at the penetration mechanism uh, on an uh, overall view. And then in the other sections, uh, later sections in the course, we then look uh, in more detail at what happens uh, after particles have penetrated the materials. Uh, so the basic point uh, here is uh, simple. Uh, we are interested in what happens if you have a radiation source uh, which affects a material and how does the radiation penetrate uh, this uh, material. Um, and uh, there are many uh, concepts which can be used to quantify this. Uh, and here is some of the very uh, simple basic ones. Uh, well, the mean depth or mean range is very easy to understand. It simply means that on average, how deep do the ions go? In reality, they almost never go to a single depth, but instead there is a, uh, a wide range profile, a profile of depths where they penetrate, and this is uh, known as the range profile or depth profile. And the mean range is per definition the statistical mean of this distribution. But then we have two other concepts which are not quite as obvious, uh, but uh, almost equally important. Uh, one is the straggling, uh, the regular straggling, which means the width of this distribution. And uh, this is almost always defined as the standard deviation of the mean, where the standard deviation is the usual definition of a standard deviation uh, in statistics. And then there is another quantity, related quantity, which is the lateral struggle, which means that if ions are penetrating uh, uh, only in a, uh, a narrow region in the center, how wide are they spreading? Or in other words, if the single ion is spreading, what is the probability distribution of where they are uh, spreading? So these are all relatively simple uh, co concepts, uh, but uh, important to know. And, uh, and as already alluded to, uh, this can be calculated uh, with uh, basic statistics uh, mathematics. And here are the definition. So, so if the depth profile is uh, it's a function of the depth, uh, concentration as a function of z, which we here denote c of z, uh, and the, where the surface is placed at z equals zero. Uh, and then this concentration, of course, to be, has to be larger than zero or equal to zero for all depths. With this definition, one can get this total concentration, the mean range, uh, and the straggling uh, of uh, these uh, quantities. Um, note here that this is really in units of concentration, so this is not uh, necessarily, this is not a probability distribution, this has a physical units of particle concentration. Well, uh, in addition to the quantities already mentioned in the last page, uh, one can uh, define other quantities uh, or principally any other quantity which relates to a probability distribution. So one can define the median, the skewness, the kurtosis, uh, full width at a half maximum and so on. The full width at a half maximum is of course closely related to the struggling. Well, then uh, there is some other terminology related to this particle penetration. Uh, well, and uh, these are all uh, also uh, relatively straightforward. Well, one is reflection, which simply means that the particle does not penetrate after all. Uh, although this is not quite trivial, because quite often what happens is that the particle does penetrate into the material for a while, but then is reflected back after scattering inside the material. Uh, but uh, the usual definition is that whenever uh, an incoming particle leaves uh, uh, from the same surface it came in backwards, uh, then it's reflected. Uh, then uh, there can be deposition, which uh, simply means that the particle doesn't penetrate but uh, stays, uh, stays uh, uh, in the substrate, or uh, that it goes uh, somewhat uh, deeper and deeper in. Here the definitions vary a little bit. Uh, uh, I mean, some, some people quite often, if particles go deeper in, it's called implantation and not deposition. Then there is sticking, uh, which is uh, mainly used at low energies uh, for, uh, and when chemical re re reactions are involved, it simply means that the particle sticks on the top surface. 
uh, and uh, as you can see the position and sticking may mean the same thing sticking is uh, usually used for when one considers that a chemical bond is formed with uh, uh, sticks the particle to the surface and the fourth key quantity on this slide is sputtering uh, which is uh, means that uh, particles are kicked out uh, due to the radiation process. To this topic of sputtering, this is one of the key radiation damage processes, and uh, we will return to the concept of sputtering in uh, quite some detail several times uh, during this course. Okay, and now we have uh, the list of uh, the same uh, same list, but now uh, how to quantify these. Uh, well, reflection is pretty obvious. What is the fraction of particles which are reflected? Deposition is again measured of what fractional particles are deposited uh, on the surface or depending on the physician on the surface or inside. And then sticking on the other hand, it's measured with us, uh, what's called the sticking coefficient, uh, which also tells that the, what is the probability that a particle uh, is, uh, uh, is stuck on the uh, surfer, uh, surface. And the fourth quantity sputtering is measured with the sputtering yield, uh, which is uh, the number of outcoming atoms divided by the number of uh, incoming uh, ions. Um, uh, so, um, so uh, and here uh, uh, this uh, sputtering yield uh, may include uh, the particle it, uh, uh, itself, uh, so uh, or usually does it with the particle, uh, par par partic particle itself. If, if it's defined in that way, then this reflection coefficient and sputtering coefficient uh, are, of course, uh, uh, re re related to each uh, other. But uh, if the ion is not the same as the material which is sputtered, then usually the sputtering yield is considered to be the sputtering yield of the material, uh, in original material, not the sputtering, not the ions which came in. So, if, for instance, if we radiate uh, tungsten with copper and say uh, if the energy sucks that uh, two tungsten atoms come out for every copper atom, uh, then you would say that the sputtering yield is, uh, uh, for tungsten is two regardless of what happens to the copper atoms, uh, sorry, copper ions which came in. So, going on uh, to some basic uh, quantities. Um, so uh, another key thing to know is what is the energy uh, of the particles coming in and what is the angle by which they come uh, in. Um, well, uh, the particles can either have a single energy uh, or have an energy spread. Of course, in reality, uh, they always have some energy spread, but uh, often the spread is so narrow that it can be ignored. Say, if, uh, for, for a mega electrovolt ions, if the uh, spread of their energy is only say 100 electrovolts, 0.01%, then it probably doesn't have any practical meaning what this spread is, and one can just ignore it and say that the energy is monoenergetic. And a similar argument is with the incoming angle. Uh, this can be also well defined uh, or with an angular uh, distribution. If we talk about beams, ion beams, electron beams, something, usually they have an incoming angle. Uh, and then it's fairly well defined. Again, in reality, there is always some spread, but uh, often it's so small that it uh, can be ignored. And uh, this is a simplified picture for an accelerator. So we have an uh, ion source, uh, which is positively biased. Then we have a negative uh, Griddorf electric field, which is eventually negative. And then the particles are accelerated from uh, uh, the, uh, due to the difference in the potential, uh, electric potential, and then they hit the target uh, at some angle. And here you now see that uh, in this case, uh, the uh, energy would come from the acceleration voltage here. So it, the energy would be uh, well defined by this acceleration voltage. And the incoming angle is well defined simply by how the target uh, is uh, rotated with respect to the incoming beam. So, uh, so in principle, this uh, incoming at, uh, incoming angle is uh, for flat samples. It's very easy to define because it's just the uh, uh, angle by which one places the sample with respect to the beam.
So that was sort of basic uh, properties of uh, particle penetration. Now next we look at, uh, to give an overview of how this happens for uh, uh, the most important kind of particles. Um, and the first is issue to consider about how penetration happens is uh, what is the charge uh, of the incoming particles. Because if they are not charged, if they are neutral, uh, then they don't interact with the electromagnetic forces, uh, and then one can exert them to go uh, dive quite deep in. Um, and this is indeed the, the, uh, the, uh, the case if our neutrons, uh, which are of course uh, neutral particles, uh, they can go even meters deep. Uh, typically they go tens of centimeters or meters uh, deep into the sample uh, materials. Um, and uh, and uh, how efficient they scatter is uh, how it depends on the mass different. Uh, if the mass is the same, it gives more, more, most uh, efficient scattering. Of course, the proton has almost exactly the same mass as the neutron, so protons are good to scatter neutrons. And this is uh, the key reason why uh, water is used to slow down neutrons in nuclear reactors. Gamma particles, that is high energy uh, photons, uh, they are also not charged and they can indeed go fairly deep uh, in materials. Here is a sample for uh, one MeV uh, gamma particles, 8 millimeter in lead, uh, lead, 44 millimeters in concrete, uh, so macroscopic distance is that deep. On the other hand, then if you are charged particles, uh, they interact strongly with any other charged particle, uh, so one will have lots of scattering and thus much smaller penetration. So for instance, for electrons, MeV electrons uh, uh, have a range uh, in copper of 350 micrometers with this uh, simple uh, equation, uh, which we, uh, can be used to estimate uh, electron uh, mean, mean ranges. And ions, on the other hand, uh, they have uh, uh, much, much smaller ranges. So one MeV protons in copper uh, would have a range of 380 nanometers, one MeV gold and copper 96 nanometers. So we see that uh, uh, while neutrons could go tens of centimeters in uh, and gammas millimeters, uh, electrons go micrometers and then ions only nanometers or hundreds of nanometers. So there really is a huge difference in these penetration depths. And uh, due to this, uh, one can indeed uh, illustrate the way how deep materials go like this. We have a picture of, uh, from Wikipedia, which uh, fairly nicely illustrates this. So for alphas, uh, it's uh, alpha particles charged helium nuclei, it's enough to have a sheet of paper to stop them. For electrons, and a macroscopic aluminum sheet is enough to stop them. Gammas, again, uh, need clearly more, and neutrons really a lot more uh, to uh, completely stop their penetration. And here is another illustration, uh, also the picture is also from uh, Wikipedia, uh, where um, which illustrates also what happens. And uh, this is what we'll give uh, more detail in a moment. So this is an initial uh, overview of it. So alphas uh, uh, ionize strongly and scatter, uh, uh, scatter with uh, many mechanisms. Uh, this Bremsstrahlung is uh, just one of them. Um, then uh, uh, beta, uh, beta particles, that is electrons, uh, they scatter, uh, scatter with other electrons uh, in the material, uh, uh, and kick out electrons, produce gammas and so on. Um, the gamma particles, uh, they also scatter from electrons, can give energy to electrons and produce additional gammas, which uh, can then move further. Neutrons again, uh, they basically only uh, uh, in the scatter from uh, 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 nuclei uh, and only if they come actually within uh, close to their nucleus size, which is femtometers, uh, if they really come essentially uh, almost inside the nucleus. Because their nuclei of atoms are so small, the probability for this is very low, and this is the basic increase of why neutrons uh, can go so deep in materials.
So this was the uh, initial uh, discussion and presentation of this uh, uh, penetration. And now in the rest of this section, uh, we will go into some more detail of uh, all of these cases uh, one by one. So first we'll deal with the photons uh, and um, and uh, when photons, when they enter material with, uh, with a high energy, uh, they uh, can ionize electrons uh, with several phenomena with the photoelectric effect and uh, Compton scattering uh, be, being pretty much the most important ones. Uh, and uh, when they scatter, they can give an electron recoil and also give them uh, uh, scatter themselves uh, or produce uh, more photons. So this actually becomes a chain uh, chain of excitations uh, and uh, so you can have uh, excited atoms uh, create additional photons. They still have an high energy. They can uh, create additional ionized electrons and these can again create more photons. So you see that there is actually a cascade uh, of electron photon collision going on. And this is indeed uh, known as what's known as an electron gamma cascade. Uh, and uh, which uh, is a sequence of collisions here. Moreover, uh, if the initial energy is higher than 10, 000, uh, 1022 keV, uh, this, this is twice the rest mass of the electrons, the gammas can also produce electron-positron pairs. Uh, that is a, a, a pair a, a biomechanism known as pair production. Uh, this is something which uh, should be familiar to you from basic uh, quantum physics courses, uh, that when a energy, uh, particle energy is high enough, it can create uh, matter-antimatter pairs, and this actually does happen uh, for high energy photons. Uh, and actually, now you realize one thing, we started talking about photons, but because electrons can do the same, you realize that uh, now we also start understanding electron penetration in matter. Uh, so high energy electrons will also get, create gammas and uh, other electrons. Uh, so the, uh, this uh, electron and photon stopping in materials is really intertwined at high energies. Um, and uh, indeed, also with computer simulations, these are quite often treated with the same codes. And this overall concept works uh, down to quite low energies, around 100 eV to 1 keV. Uh, and the reason to this lower limit is that below this energy, the electrons and gammas, uh, they don't really behave like individual particles anymore, but uh, have the quantum, quantum wave character. And then uh, this becomes much more difficult to understand. One cannot treat it in this uh, relatively simple uh, particle-like uh, description given here. So now logically and easily we get over to electrons. Uh, so uh, we already discussed the photons, but uh, this already told a lot, uh, basically the picture for high energy electrons as well. However, there is a, a very important uh, case uh, which is not really treated with this. And that is what happens in uh, transmission electron microscopes. Uh, transmission electron microscopes work with electrons, but uh, using the quantum mechanical wave-like nature of electrons as a help, so that the electrons be uh, behave in the microscope uh, uh, pretty much like light, like a wave function. Um, and, uh, and this is indeed modeled uh, in a wave picture of the particles. Uh, and and uh, this may sound weird, uh, weird different from the previous case, but there is no paradox here. Uh, uh, as you know, I mean, each particle is, uh, can either be considered a particle or a wave uh, due to the quantum mechanical particle wave duality. Uh, and uh, due to this, I mean, uh, this is one picture of what happens uh, and the previous was one another. Um, and at very high energies, uh, hundreds of uh, uh, mega electrovolts and higher, this uh, electron gamma cascade picture is uh, uh, usually more reasonable. And that high energies also are not used uh, for in electron microscopes normally, uh, whereas in this energy range around uh, 100 keV uh, the plus minus half an order of magnitude, uh, this uh, wave picture works well uh, and is indeed used in the electron microscopes. Moreover, the electrons have also another uh, peculiar feature. 
But if, if you go to very low energies, uh, a few hundred electrovolts, uh, this picture changes one more time. That is, uh, if I look at the mean free path, that is uh, when electrons are colliding uh, in a zigzag pattern. Um, now I can illustrate this with a pen. So something when they are mean free paths, of course, means that you have collisions every now and then, and then in between they move more or less straight. Uh, in this kind of a picture, the mean free path decreases with energy uh, uh, for a good while, and this is quite natural. It would seem the less energy, uh, the easier it is to collide. However, uh, below about 50 V, uh, the uh, mean free path starts increasing again strongly. Um, and this is uh, because this uh, issue that the electrons uh, interact with the electronic structure of the material uh, as a wave function like manner and uh, and this uh, uh, the particle like picture really doesn't work and uh, and due to this I mean uh, also the mean range shown here on the right side you can see that this is a peculiar feature because you can like here you have an almost flat region of the mean uh, of this uh, mean range uh, because of this minimum uh, in the uh, this mean free path uh, description. Also for electrons, there is one, uh, for damage by electrons, there is one uh, important issue to know. Um, that is, uh, electrons can hit nuclei. Nuclei are of course charged, so this is quite natural. The probability of hitting a nucleus is not so big because the nuclei are very small. Uh, but uh, it does happen, uh, and uh, much of the time it happens elastically. And then you have a, a binary collision, which uh, uh, can be considered at low energies with classical kinematics. Um, the reason this uh, I mentioned is that in many cases uh, these uh, ballistic collisions are actually the main source of radiation damage. Well, uh, if the energy is so low that there are no relativistic effects, uh, one can, uh, this can be treated with classical uh, binary collision equations, uh, which are usually treated on the first year physics uh, courses. Uh, in the basic uh, mechanics and kinematics courses. And uh, the key equation for this is this equation here. Uh, and this is an important equation because it also relates to ions, which will be used later on in the course. So I'll emphasize it a bit. So what this says that uh, if you want to know the maximum energy an atom can get in a collision with an electron, you take the electron mass, multiply it with the atom mass, uh, it collides with, uh, multiply with four, and then divide by m electron plus m atom squared, uh, and then multiply with the uh, uh, electron energy. And this also works for atom-atom uh, -atom collisions. Then you just replace, replace the at ele electron collision, electron mass with the atom mass. But now for electrons, the electron mass is at least uh, very much lower than the uh, ion mass. Uh, so one can approximate this that uh, the m electron plus m atom is roughly a m atom, and then this equation becomes uh, uh, gets a simpler form given here. And from this form, because the electron mass is much less than the atom mass, uh, you can see that it's obvious that you give uh, the atom can receive a, a very small fraction of the electron energy. So, for instance, if you put in values for silicon, one gets uh, um, uh, the uh, that the electron uh, energy is divided by about uh, 13,000. Uh, so if one has uh, 100 kV electrons, the energy they could give uh, to, to a silicon atom would be less than uh, 10, uh, 10 uh, elect electron volts. But uh, there is an important thing uh, to know here already actually an energy of 100 keV, the rest mass of the electron is only 511 keV, so already at this mass relativistic equation effects start to be important. And uh, so in many cases for electron one should actually use the relativistic equation which is given here. Uh, and this is an exact uh, relativistic equation from relativistic kinematics. And here the uh, notation is a little bit shortened from the previous one. 
So this is important to remember that for uh, for electrons you may and um, uh, it's safer to use this relativistic kinematics equation. Well, the other big issue is to how big is the calculation of the this uh, prob how probable it is to have a collision. Now for this. Uh, uh, we'll mention one standard equation which is used a lot uh, for this topic, which is known as the mckinley feshbach equation or equation. And this is the original reference uh, and another reference which uh, writes it in a more easier form. And actually the key equation is uh, written out here uh, and I won't certainly start reading it out now uh, in these video notes, but uh, if you need it, you can read it here or check these uh, original uh, references. But uh, the one thing I would like to mention about the McKinley-Fishbeck equations, they are useful, but they are not exact. Um, they are approximate, so if one wants to have really high accuracy, one has to be a bit careful and maybe go back to the original definitions to, or experiments to check uh, how accurate they actually uh, are. But uh, very much of the time they are accurate enough and give quite reasonable uh, results. And for electrons, uh, finally, i still mention these uh, interaction cross-sections that uh, uh, here is a overview table for carbon atoms. What is the probability of different processes? So you see that these atom displacements, uh, what I just mentioned, uh, <coughs> the probability is much lower, uh, several orders of magnitude lower than the other eff effects. But uh, we are still slightly emphasize this because uh, especially for metals, uh, these atom displacement are still often the dominant damage process because these ionizations don't really cause any damage. They can of course cause gamma emission and so on, uh, which can be measured uh, electron emission, uh, but for uh, the radiation damage, uh, these uh, displacements uh, are often the key quantity. Then in insulators, it's quite possible that all of these other processes, ionized electrons and gammas also produce uh, material damage. This concludes the fourth part of this uh, the video lecture of this uh, section. Then the next video we will go on to neutrons.